Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, ADR World Tour, Arbitration and Mediation as a Global Force for Good. We'll get started in just a moment. If you could indicate where you're calling in from today in the chat function. Uh, we've had representation from 60 different countries and our panelists only, and we appreciate you being here today, wherever you might be. Welcome to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, ADR World, World Tour, Arbitration and Mediation as a Global Force for Good. Um, again, folks are rolling in. We'll begin in just a few moments. If you could use the chat function to let us know where you're calling in from. Welcome Ross from the Central Organizing Group, Long Island, New York. Ah, there we go. Katarina's in from England. She's winning. <laughs> Richard's calling in from Florida. Welcome to everybody. Thank you for being here. This is week 11 of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators ADR World Tour. Our grand finale, we started in Asia and we visited 17 regions throughout the world. Welcome from Dallas, welcome from Chicago, welcome from Washington DC and Seattle, Washington, Philadelphia. This is fantastic. Thank you to everybody for being here today. And we have Chris calling in from Canada. Uh, welcome to all, we'll begin in just another minute. Ah, Patrika, you win. Bucharest, Romania, in the house. Great to have you. Thank you so much. Welcome to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. We'll be starting in just one more minute. Persenia, welcome from Chicago. All right, let's begin. Um, my name is Brian Brannon, and I serve on the North America Branch Board of Directors of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and its Young Members Group Steering Committee. On behalf of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Young Members Groups, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the ADR World Tour, Arbitration and Mediation as a Global Force for Good. The Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Young Members Group presents a series of international webinars which highlight the unique importance and efficiency ADR provides in allowing the world's economy to remain operative and functional even during times of great economic uncertainty. Perhaps no greater time of economic uncertainty has ever existed than today. 11 regional webinars will have taken place. We are in week 11, North America, each of the webinars have focused on ADR and access to justice, ADR as a means to strengthen the rule of law, and ADR as an efficient alternative to traditional litigation. The ADR World Tour is powered by a group of 19 volunteer organizers from 15 regions throughout the world. Today, I am pleased to be joined by my colleague and friend, Harut Samra. Haru is up counsel at DLA Piper and an international dispute resolution practitioner based in Miami, Florida. Haru is also a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Haru and I will co-moderate today's panel. And just to let everybody know, we are recording and a series of poll questions will be popping up on your screen that we ask that you answer. Uh, they will be used in an international comparative analysis of arbitration and mediation as a global force for good. Without further ado, Harup. Uh, thank you so much, Brian, and I too am looking forward to today's program. It's a pleasure to host not only our esteemed panel, but also to work with you uh, to moderate, I think, what will be a really interesting conversation. So we'll begin by introducing our panel members, and I will take the first introduction of my good friend and, and former colleague, Cecilia Assad. Cecilia is a lawyer specialized in international arbitration, mediation, and judicial proceedings related to international or rather alternative means of dispute resolution with more than 25 years of experience. She joined Galicia as a partner in 2018, where she focuses her practice on complex domestic and international commercial disputes. 
She acts as an arbitrator, counsel, mediator, or expert, and has developed a broad experience, particularly in cases related to energy infrastructure, construction, and commercial mediation. Among her clients are national and foreign companies that have entered into agreements related to the energy, construction, or infrastructure sectors. Her recent cases include complex disputes arising from uh, public-private agreements, as well as a variety of other areas, including distribution, technology transfer, and international sales. Cecilia is recognized for her expertise and record of accomplishment in complex judicial matters, including those related to arbitration before Mexico's courts, including enforcement and other proceedings. Uh, she works closely with a variety of other practices as well, including investor state dispute settlement, uh, including matters involving uh, analysis of investment protection, uh, investment protection uh, treaties to which Mexico is a party. She served as president of the Mexican Institute of Arbitration, the Instituto Mexicano de Arbitraje, uh, from 2019 to 2020, and is currently the vice president of the Arbitration Commission of the ICC in Mexico. She's appointed as well as a conciliator for Mexico uh, to ICSID and is a member of the International Arbitration Court currently of the ICC as well. Previously, she served as Secretary General and Counsel of the Mexican Arbitration Center and has served as a consultant for the mediation project in Mexico sponsored by the American Bar Association, the ABA and USAID. She regularly publishes and speaks on alternative dispute resolution and teaches arbitration and mediation and she is recommended by Who's Who's Legal as both a national and global leader where she's been praised in chambers among others for her analytical skills and as well as being described in the Legal 500 as a highly respected arbitration specialist. Welcome, Ceci. Next we have uh, the Honorable Chief Judge Nanette Jolivet Brown, the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Louisiana. Chief Judge Brown was appointed by President Barack Obama in 2011. She is the first female African-American federal district court judge in the history of Louisiana. In 2018, she elevated to being the chief judge for the Eastern District. In this position, Chief Judge uh, Jolivet Brown is the first African-American chief judge in the history of Louisiana. Before uh, her, her judgeship, she was a deputy mayor and city attorney for the city of New Orleans. She was also a commercial environmental uh, partner at Chafee McCall in New Orleans as well. Uh, during Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, uh, Chief, uh, then uh, Nanette Jolivet Brown helped implement the Louisiana Insurance uh, Hurricane Recovery Program in collaboration with the American Arbitration Association. She mediated hundreds of disputes while displaced herself. Uh, out of that experience, the chief judge contributed to the founding of the mediation section of the Loyola New Orleans College of Law Clinic and Center for Social Justice. Before this, Chief Judge Brown also served as the director of the Louisiana Department of Sanitation, where she helped establish the first curbside recycling program in the city of New Orleans. Welcome, Chief Judge Brown. Fantastic. Our next speaker is Professor Anthony Dimesis. Professor Dimesis has been teaching at the University of Ottawa since 2003 and is the director of the Bi-Jural Common Law and Civil Law National Program at the law school. He teaches contracts, international sales, international commercial arbitration, and coaches the faculty's Jessup, Viz, and FDI meet teams. Professor Dimesis is also the Director of Education for the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Canadian branch, and an Associate Door Tenant at Middleton Chambers in London, England, and a member of their International Arbitration Practice Group. His experience includes serving as both counsel and arbitrator, and as an expert witness on foreign investment disputes, telecommunications and underground resources, in addition to the international commercial contract and construction disputes resolved under the offices of various international commercial arbitration institutions. Welcome, Professor. And last but not least, we have Nancy Thevenin, principal and founder of Thevenin Arbitration and ADR based in New York, New York. Nancy is also a fellow with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. She is the Haitian delegate to the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, and she serves as general counsel for the U.S. Council on International Business, 
which is the ICC uh, portion for North America uh, for the United States. In her spare time, Nancy is an adjunct professor of international commercial arbitration at St. John's University School of Law. Welcome to Nancy. And so fantastic. Thank you, uh, Brian. And with that, maybe we'll jump right into the substance of today's discussion. Uh, as many of you may have already noticed, there are polls that are going to be published over the course of today's program. Uh, please have a look. If you, if you will please respond to them, we've been doing this in every one of these international programs and have actually really built up some fantastic and very interesting data. So please keep an eye out for those and respond if you are able. So to begin the discussion, we're going to talk about some of the different national perspectives that are represented here. Uh, being the North America session, we have representatives from each of the principal jurisdictions in the region. Um, and we'll be providing a little bit of an overview uh, from each of the countries that are represented, namely Canada, the United States, and, and Mexico. So I'll begin with uh, Cecilia. Cecilia, can you tell us a little bit about some recent significant developments that have occurred in Mexico as it relates to arbitration and ADR? Perfect. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. I'll go straight to the point. So as you probably know, uh, Mexico has a pro-arbitration uh, legal framework. And by that, I mean, um, first, the local regulations are adapted to the, model, uh, to the model law, to the UNCITRAL model law. And those regulations apply to both domestic and international arbitration. We have ratified the New York Convention and the Panama Convention in the 17th, last, last century. Uh, and we have signed more than 30 bilateral investment treaties and free trade agreements uh, that include, as you know, an arbitration mechanism for uh, investment disputes. So generally speaking, and leaving aside a couple of controversial uh, decisions on jurisdiction regarding the validity of the arbitration clause, uh, the Mexican judiciary supports um, the arbitration system uh, by following the New York Convention standards uh, by, uh, for recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards and arbitration agreements. As per mediation on the other side, uh, the use of uh, mediation has faced uh, some challenges in the, in the, in the last years. Uh, there has been an important development from the civil perspective of mediation uh, by the establishment of uh, several uh, court annex uh, uh, programs, mediation programs. But uh, we haven't seen such development in the same uh, arena uh, or in the same extent for the commercial arbitration, for private, uh, uh, sorry, mediation, for commercial and private mediation. Um, for the commercial mediation um, to face a real boost in Mexico, uh, we need to have a federal slash national regulation, what we don't have. Uh, that could probably solve uh, every discussion related to certified mediators um, for mediation as a requirement to file a claim and some other aspects that have in some way represented a kind of obstacle to the development of commercial mediation. So important uh, development for arbitration, some differences between civil and commercial mediation. And that's like very general speaking in terms of uh, legal framework. Now, in terms of recent developments, uh, what I have to say is that energy matters uh, have monopolized the discussion in the last 18 months. Uh, the very aggressive uh, change of speech from the current administration has uh, triggered several proceedings. And again, the discussion is centered on the energy sector. So if we want to speak about recent development, um, those developments, again, are, are deeply centered in the energy sector, both electricity and oil and gas. Construction as well, because those are related uh, projects to the energy matters, 
But I would say that, uh, again, in terms of recent development, energy sector is the monopoly. Thank you, Sassy. Brian? Thank you, Sassy. Thank you, Harut. Uh, just a, a reminder to everybody, we have a question and answer chat function. As we go along, please utilize it. Uh, the panel will try to get to all the questions you might have. Uh, moving from Mexico to Canada, Anthony, uh, if you could talk a little bit about some of the big developments in terms of arbitration and mediation as a global force for good as it relates to Canada. Thank you, Brian. Well, we've had quite a few developments here in Canada. We are, a, we have technically 11 jurisdictions. We have a bunch of provinces and then our main federal one. So I thought I'd focus on what our Supreme Court of Canada has been dealing with for the past few years and a case that they may be dealing with. It is in the leave stage. And they are quite interesting. One of them has to do with let's call it Canada's answer to Uber. That is a rather big development. And I think I'll talk more about that later on when we talk about how our lawmakers are adjusting to it. But what's interesting in our Uber decision is that our court decided to come up with a new approach to determining when to stay proceedings in favor of arbitration and when not to. And this new standard, this new ground is what they've described as a real prospect. And the way the court thought about it was through the lens of access to justice. And they said, well, if this clause as written will not lead to an actual arbitration, in other words, there is no real prospect that the parties or one of the parties in particular will ever use arbitration well, we are not going to enforce it. And that was a context uh, in the Uber case. It was felt that the Uber driver, although perhaps not an employee, was unlikely to fork over effectively a full year salary to try to get an arbitration in Denmark off the ground. And so while it was not before this case, a recognized ground, after all, if you're the way our legislation works if it's binary. You're either a consumer or you are not a consumer. And the tests were not really well developed for those, the estuary of where perhaps a small or micro business, an independent contractor sits, who is not an employee, but may be a bit difficult to refer to as a true business. So that's one of the big developments. And we are now seeing a response by Uber to it, but I'll save that for later. Another really interesting development that uh, is taking place in Canada is, well, we're not sure if our courts really have a handle on the separability doctrine, one of these foundational doctrines of arbitration. And I'm sure everyone in the audience today is familiar with it, but it's always useful maybe to refresh everyone's memory. This is the idea that where a party tries to attack a contract that contains an arbitration agreement, and it tries to, by attacking the main contract, derivatively attacking the arbitration contract, well, arbitration has this neat little idea of separability where we get to, for the purposes of maintaining the jurisdiction of the tribunal, separate the clause. Now, what our courts seem to be doing is taking separability to new places. And uh, it was in the context of a receivership. So a company that went into receivership and our laws in Canada say that a receiver is permitted to disaffirm contracts that have not yet come due, but permitted to retain contracts that certainly um, amounts are due to the party and receivership. What this company did and the courts accepted was to take one of these contracts where money was owed but it contained an arbitration agreement and it disaffirmed the arbitration agreement, keeping only the main contract. So the thought here is that it is a new way of approaching separability um, to some, perhaps not the right way, but that case is now in leave to our Supreme Court of Canada. So we'll have to see what our Supreme Court does. The last point I'll talk about is 
all our jurisdictions are currently struggling with what is the standard of review to set aside an arbitration agreement. And what we have seen through our provincial jurisdictions is some of them seem to be drawing directly from our administrative law principles, others pushing back saying, well, that is not appropriate. Judicial review is not what we're talking about when it comes to arbitration. Some of the more interesting discussions are that, well, the arbitrator may not even be a lawyer, so how perplexing is it to start introducing these standards of what we call correctness, getting the law right, when the parties have seemingly not wanted necessarily a legal decision, but one that was really based on other principles. So I'll stop there, but I am contractually bound as a Canadian citizen to mention that Canada may have been late to the game on the New York Convention, but we were the first jurisdiction to adopt the model law. Well, there it is. Thank you, Professor Dames. Uh, yeah. Moving over to Haru. Yeah, thank you. And, and you touched on some of the themes that I think we're going to be coming up, both of you have, you, uh, that are going to be coming up over and over again, access to justice, as well as um, you know, some of the other things that we're going to be talking about, including cases before the Supreme Court. And so in that, I, I will turn it to uh, another good friend, Nancy Thevenin, uh, who's gonna be talking about some of these issues and recent developments as well in the United States. Nancy? Thank you, Harut. I um, forgot my other glasses, so forgive me. Um, so this is mainly for those of you who are not that familiar with arbitration. So forgive me for the Americans who are very comfortable with this information. Uh, many of you know that the U.S. is a very popular place for arbitration, not only with respect to the applicable law in international arbitration, uh, the most popular of which is New York. So if you look at the, uh, the, the statistics from the arbitral institutions, you'll see that New York is often selected, New York law is often selected as the applicable law in international commercial contracts. You'll also see that uh, the U.S. is a popular venue for international arbitration. Why is that? Of course, following on Ceci's presentation, New York, um, the U.S. is a signatory to the New York Convention since 1970. It has an implementing legislation to the New York Convention in Chapter 2 of the FAA. Now, as you know, New York has 50, uh, the U.S. has 50 states, and each of them have their own systems. But for the most part, the U.S. is seen as having modern arbitration statutes akin to what we would say of um, countries that adopt the model law. In the US, only about six states have adopted the model law, but uh, a place like New York that hasn't adopted the model law is seen as very progressive. And I think the reason for that is because it is very clear that we have a, a federal system that ha is, has a pro-arbitration stance with respect to recognizing arbitration agreements and enforcing arbitration awards. Now, what has been happening in the past year? Um, so in the past 12 months, we've had several interesting developments. And one of the first ones, um, going back to uh, what Ceci said to our Mexican colleagues and Canadian colleagues, is of course the change to NAFTA. That's a, that was a, big, a biggie in uh, North America. Um, it was felt that much of NAFTA stayed the same, but what was clear there was that they really limited uh, investor state dispute settlement. So for example, Canada is no longer a part of the investor state dispute settlement of NAFTA. And I'm gonna leave it to my colleagues to explain to you more about what that means. Um, on the US side, I believe it, it, it is that we cannot sue uh, Canada in ISDS for breach of the provisions of NAFTA or vice versa. And it also limited with respect to the US and Mexico, the grounds the, um, upon which they, um, you can file arbitration. And some of it are what Ceci mentioned on uh, oil and gas projects, infrastructure projects, construction projects, telecommunications. And then when those when disputes are not in those areas, then there's a new requirement that that the parties exhaust um, um, the mechanisms, the uh, dispute resolution mechanisms of the country uh, where where the dispute arose. Um, so NAFTA was a biggie for us. Um, what else? We had also 
um, a Supreme Court ruling on uh, non-parties or, or um, allowing a third party in the Orukumpu case, uh, US Supreme Court, and that was quite surprising. Uh, it allowed a non-party to enforce an arbitration agreement. And that was quite interesting. The parties had agreed to an arbitration, um, had an arbitration agreement that provided that it, the, the agreement uh, also applied to subcontractors. So it was a situation where the subcontractor sought to enforce the arbitration against the main party. So the main party, of course, argued, you can't do that because you are in a signatory and the New York Convention requires a writing. The Supreme Court held that's, that's not necessary and it could be done uh, under the doctrine of equitable estoppel. So that was a quite interesting case, um, raising a lot of debate. Of course, we've had um, a very interesting case having to do with evident partiality, and that one affected one arbitral institution, the main arbitral institution that operates in the US more than others. Um, and it was a case where the, uh, the court found that because an arbitrator um, held um, uh, interest or, or, or uh, shares, in an arbitral institution that would, uh, that had to be disclosed and was um, set aside the award based on evident partiality. Now that case is being criticized. Um, as many of you know, the issue of evident partiality does not come into play for um, international arbitration where the seat of arbitration was abroad, but where the seat of arbitration is in the US there is always the fear in the US that the standards for setting aside awards under chapter one of the FAA could apply to the arbitration. And uh, used to be, we said it's never happened, but there are one or two cases where that has happened. So we're always watching that. But I guess the biggest news uh, of all that's happening in the US is 1782, uh, 28 USC section 1782, which refers to um, it allows parties involved in foreign um, arbitral proceedings uh, to uh, request U.S. district courts for discovery against, you, uh, against parties uh, bound in the district. So, uh, and it, this is quite an interesting in issue because arbitration, arbitration practitioners love and hate it. We love it because it's, it's a uh, discovery tool. It's a tool that allows us to get documents and production of documents, witnesses to appear easily. However, we don't love it because it's a tool that appears to be more available for foreign parties against U.S. parties. And of course, we don't, U.S. parties, have the same types of mechanisms abroad because most of the systems are civil law and they have limited, um, for example, um, disclosure requirements. So I don't want to go over my time, um, but we can talk about that further. That case, Servotronics, is before the Supreme Court right now, and we're all eager to find out how the Supreme Court is going to decide. Does 1782 apply to private international arbitrations or just public arbitral bodies and the circuits are split. The cases are all over the place uh, with respect to different arbitral institutions. So we're, we are all keeping our eye out on, on that case. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Nancy. And yes, we are all keeping an eye on that case. Uh, Brian. Thank you, Haru. Um, Chief Judge Brown, after leading Louisiana's Hurricane Katrina and Rita recovery efforts, uh, utilizing mediation as a global force for good, um, which led to the founding of the Loyola, Loyola University uh, College of Law's mediation clinic. Um, can you discuss arbitration and mediation as a global force for good during times of disaster, economic uncertainty, and similar? Yes. First, I want to thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, it is really, it's very much an honor for me to be included in this discussion. You know, when disasters hit, all systems are down and people grapple um, uh, to try to get their lives back in order. Uh, sometimes they are both liter literally, right? Digging themselves out of a disaster. Um, not only court systems are down, communication systems, uh, utility systems, um, and uh, 
when we were formed, and it's, it's um, you know, very flattering, you know, to refer to me as leading it all. It was a team of a lot of, a lot of people and um, especially a lot of lawyers, uh, mediators, arbitrators, just coming to the rescue because you had a lot of people um, uh, who needed access to resources. And we viewed it as um, an access to justice issue um, uh, because there were just large amounts of people that could not move forward to getting their lives back on track. So the primary areas um, that I was involved in, is, as you men mentioned, was uh, AAA uh, stepped up uh, with some urging uh, from the governor and the attorney general um, to provide a group of mediators to help uh, mediate insurance disputes. Um, and these are the kinds of disputes, I mean, I literally personally did hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them um, because they aren't the kind that, you know, uh, uh, there's often uh, to many people may think small amounts of money, but they were all the money uh, that people were trying to pull themselves back together, you know, um, had access to. Um, so they weren't the kinds of cases that lawyers normally want to take on on contingency, right? So there was a, bi a business incentive against a represent, you know, representation in those areas. Um, the, uh, the clinic we established at uh, Loyola Law School that was uh, funded by the Attorney General's office, we focused on the um, contractor disputes, right? <laughs> you get your insurance money and then you have average individuals negotiating with contractors and some of the contractors, quite frankly, it was the first time they had formed a business. Um, so, you know, there were a lot of issues around and it got to be really so complicated uh, because again, you had many thousands of people displaced, many thousands of people, you know, fighting for these resources that our criminal courts um, set up uh, uh, in the realm of restorative justice, right? Mediation for restitution in lieu of incarceration. So uh, we trained law students to help, um, help mediate in those instances. Also, we were training law students and people from the community um, uh, to mediate some common things that you don't think about that could really be a problem for you <clears throat> in a disaster, like just spousal support, <laughs> child support, child custody issues, um, negotiations with your utility bill, right? I mean, you get a thousand dollar utility bill and you've been displaced for three months um, uh, would be an example. That's not an actual example, but I'm, I'm just saying those are the kinds of, of issues that some of us, um, you lose sight of uh, uh, during a disaster that um, are really necessary. Um, so we were able to uh, put a lot of those uh, measures in place, but what I would encourage is, you know, uh, as we know now, there's a disaster always around the corner. Uh, you know, uh, we're getting through this pandemic, but we are already being told there'll be another one. Just prepare. Um, you know, so this what that experience experience showed me and showed a lot of us here in New Orleans is that you have to prepare for disasters. Uh, we didn't have a ground game before that happened. Now we've seen, you know, we've witnessed other disasters around the world since then. Um, but it certainly is instructive to know and, and be sensitive to the fact that uh, how individuals struggle in a crisis, small businesses struggle in a crisis. So our goal was not, I mean, um, it really was um, a on the ground um, community effort. And as I said, the goal was access to justice. Um, and, and that was the focus. So um, certainly there were, there were a lot of high level uh, mediations and arbitrations going on. Um, but this was just the, you know, the aspect that we focused on uh, with the group that I worked on. And I think, you know, um, as, as, uh, as professionals, uh, lawyers, we always have to remember that we are public servants and we have an obligation, particularly in crisis, uh, to offer our services. And that's what that project was about. And I'm you know, um, I'm so glad, uh, Brian, that you remembered that <laughs> as we are in an, another disaster <laughs> of sorts, um, because it's times like this where we have to remember 
um, the full scope of uh, you know, the role we all play in society to make sure that things move forward. And so you know, that was one part in my life where I'm very proud of the fact that I was able to contribute. So um, with that, I thank you again for inviting me to participate. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you so much. Uh, and, and so we actually wanted to springboard from, from part of what you said, and, and we talked continuing to develop some of these themes. Uh, part of what inspired this whole series of webinars was the role of ADR in the challenges that we've had over the last year um, and developing some of the themes that we talked about already today, access to justice and others as well. Uh, so part of what we'll do over the next few minutes is talk about how this has played out in each of the respective, uh, respective jurisdictions we represent here today, uh, the role of ADR in facing global challenges. Uh, so turning first to Professor Dimesis, what legal challenges have arisen in Canada in connection with this recent pandemic, of course, or the current, I should say, pandemic? Uh, and has arbitration and mediation or, or alternative dispute resolution generally been used as a tool to help address some of these challenges? Uh, it certainly has. So the challenge is we went into lockdown in March of 2020, and there was a lot of uncertainty uh, in the legal community for cases that were pending before courts and that were scheduled for the courts. And this is, I, I wanna be very clear, this is in no way a criticism of the courts. The court system is, is an institution and it cannot simply overnight make decisions. There are, there are many layers and levels. The consequence of that is that they were understandably more conservative. And so they were slower to adapt. So what I saw was firms whose, and this is where the, the ADR as a power of good came in, firms whose clients wanted resolution, so truly resolution, were seeking out some of us, and I was fortunate enough to be one of those, to help them draft submission agreements, for example, to get them to actually go to an alternative form of arbitration to resolve their disputes. Still more, though, more firms, and this is anecdotal, I, I can't provide you data other than what I know of my own community here, uh, were telling me that parties were settling more. So they were using negotiation because the uncertainty that the pandemic created meant that for some, it really started to make more sense. Now, my hope is that that's going to create a spillover because often when you don't have an, an alternative that you're almost forced into, you don't appreciate it as much. It shows that many disputes perhaps don't need to clog up our court system, the valuable resources of our court, which, uh, you know, from my perspective are perhaps better spent on other disputes, family disputes, criminal justice, maybe not so much the commercial and smaller uh, business disputes that could benefit from the settlement. So that has been the experience in Canada. The last point I would, I would just make is an uptick in arbitration has definitely been felt. One of our big arbitration uh, venues, Arbitration Place, which has offices in Toronto and Ottawa, uh, has been busy, 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 busy. They're, I, I don't know how they manage to take care of all the work they do, but they do. And um, so that's beneficial on so many other levels, not merely that it's creating uh, more revenue for Canada, but it just shows that there are, there is a way to resolve disputes uh, that don't necessarily have to follow, follow the classic court process. And maybe the pandemic has showed that for parties who perhaps knew about alternative dispute, but didn't really use it. Of course, the users have always been happy. Now, arbitration has just kind of through the pandemic kept going with the only real hiccup, the question of virtual hearings and cross-examination and everything else we hear about, but ultimately we find out it's not the end of the world. So I won't monopolize the time, but that's, that's what uh, from up north, what we've been seeing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and moving back to the chief judge, uh, we had a, a brief conversation before the webinar went live about the difference between the pandemics, arbitration and mediation as a global force for good versus what you experienced 
um, previously during your work with uh, Louisiana's insurance and AAA. Can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, uh, you know, some obvious differences is that, um, you know, um, at that time we were, you were still allowed to interface, right? We can, um, and um, as a former mediator myself, I know the importance of getting two people who are in dispute in the same room, right? Um, so that element, um, mm -hmm has been missing. And we also didn't have the same technology. We didn't have Zoom, which virtually puts us in the same room. Um, it, you know, and so uh, those are some of the differences in the fact that New Orleans was, uh, you know, hit in sort of isolation, at least the Gulf Coast area, but the rest of the world was up and operating, um, which changed the dynamic of a lot of, you know, a lot of the issues. But, you know, I'm always, I'm always in favor of, of uh, uh, al alternative dispute resolution, even as a judge for some practical matters, uh, reasons. I mean, you know, if, it's, if you're in business with someone and you need to continue that business relationship, it's better to try to find a resolution, a, uh, you know, a negotiated resolution um, than to have the a court, you know, uh, just sort of drop the hammer on the, <laughs> the decision, right? Um, I think that's always really important for even personal relationships moving forward, but certainly in complex business relationships, I think it's very helpful to be aware of um, also the skill involved in the individuals who are in dispute and just sort of tap into that um, and, and, and just uh, help them resolve it. The Eastern District of Louisiana has a long history of having um, internal alternative dispute resolution uh, processes in place um, in the early, uh, dating back to the early 70s, we were the second busiest court in the country. People may not uh, realize that, you know, at one time we each judge had thousands of cases. Um, uh, still, we were a court that uh, multi-district litigation finds a home here. We have several um, uh, uh, cases that are multi-district. And so uh, we have judges who are, have an extreme amount of expertise in trying to help resolve, right, cases that involve thousands of, of litigants across various uh, jurisdictions. Um, so we have in place with our magistrate judges who are highly trained, um, uh, and it's, it's uh, included in almost all of our um, scheduling orders at least six weeks before trial after discovery, um, uh, you know, they're ordered to mediate, right? But you can't make people resolve there. Um, but it is it is an effort to encourage the parties, especially after they've had an opportunity um, to get some discovery and answer, you know, questions answered, to try to amicably resolve them with the aid of a mediator. Uh, it just reminds me, though, Brian, of one you know one other difference about the pandemic is that um, it has been hard for people to get information through discovery. Uh, I hear a lot of that and. It's hard, again, to get people to resolve their disputes if they feel that they don't have enough information or they don't have the information they need to make an informed decision. Um, and so that's a little different too from uh, uh, the, the last disaster I lived through um, and this one. So look, I, you know, I, I say this openly, um, I'm so grateful uh, to our magistrate judges and in opportunities that judges like myself find um, to provide an alternative method to resolve disputes through this pandemic, it has kept us afloat. My court has not begun having jury trials again. We're, you know, uh, we're going to resume that shortly. Uh, but in a city like New Orleans, we have a lot of factors of, um, you know, the virus hit this city very hard after Mardi Gras. We have a large minority population and um, a very large uh, uh, underserved population. And so we have to act, you know, very carefully before we drag people in court and, and expose them uh, to the virus. That is something we balance, right, against the other interests that, that litigants have. So, look, um, uh, mediation, other types of alternative dispute resolution uh, has kept us moving. And our docket, we are not behind because... Um, we have been able to help parties move along. As judges, we're deciding motions, you know, and that helps you resolve your dispute, <laughs> you know? I hear a lot, a lot of lawyers say, <clears throat> judge, please don't decide that motion. We're really close to resolving it. <laughs> but if you decide that motion, it's gonna end this negotiation very quickly. So 
I think it's been um, it's been quite an asset uh, to keep actually keep the court moving forward, keep our dockets moving forward to have the benefit of alternative dispute resolution. Well, thank you so much, Judge. Yeah, thank you, Judge. And and so as, as we continue to work through the region on this question, I'll turn to Ceci. And, and if you could tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that have arisen in Mexico resulting from the pandemic and how or whether EDR has been a useful tool in addressing it. Thank you. Thank you, Farouk. Yeah, um, in, in, in my opinion, for, for arbitration, I think the main challenge remains cost and time efficiency. I mean, we have spoken about uh, the advantages of arbitration for years. I remember myself uh, 25 years ago. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's say 20 years ago, when I started working at the Mexican Arbitration Center, uh, we used to uh, present this um, nice PowerPoint um, presentation with a nice list of advantages of arbitration for us to explain to, to clients or to potential users of the, of the set of rules, the advantages of arbitration. I think this is the moment to prove those advantages. I, I, I can even say that probably ADR at, are put into test right now or even scrutinized. I mean, this is the moment where efficiency needs to be proven. So speaking about Mexico, I mean, and, and, and knowing how we practice and how my colleagues practice law in Mexico, I think that we need to challenge our own practices, our own beliefs. And Mexican lawyers um, need to opt for another and more efficient proceedings centered in facts and in solutions and not in formalities. Two years ago, we had that constitutional modification constitutional modification and the constitutional body included a misspecification in terms of the importance of prioritizing the merits of the case versus formality. And of course that modification was addressed mainly for judges, but I think this is something all practitioners need to understand we need to um, stop contaminating ADRs with uh, excessive formalities and let's say judiciary practices. And we need to center in efficiency. So that's, I think, for arbitration. Specifically speaking about mediation, again, the big challenge remains enforceability of the mediation settlement. Erasing the differences I mentioned, I mentioned between civil and commercial mediation, judicial and private mediation. If we don't move ahead or if we don't move forward in one way, erasing those differences, we won't see a boost in the mediation uh, development. So I'll, 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 I'll center my comment on those points. In, in summary, um, I think we need cooperation between lawyers in terms of effective conduction of the proceedings, clients in believing in ADR, and of course, judges, the judiciary, in terms of enforcement and recognition of settlements, awards, arbitration agreements. We, I, I really want to stress this. I, I think this is the moment for ADR. 
and we cannot fail. Yeah, thank you, Ceci, and, and there's a lot there, I think. Uh, and, and maybe this is an opportunity, Brian, to make a shameless plug for those who are interested in hearing about in-house counsel perspectives. The second half of our North America series is going to focus on in-house counsel perspectives, and we're going to be talking about exactly some of these issues uh, that you described, including with uh, in-house counsel who are frequent, obviously, clients of ADR or consumers of ADR and who will have an opportunity to talk about you know, what they've learned and where we go from here. But thank you for those remarks, Ceci. Uh, Brian? Yeah, to quote Ceci, this is the moment for ADR. I'm using that <laughs> with attribution. Um, we actually are joined today by a general counsel um, of the United States Council for International Business, Nancy Thevenin. And so, Nancy, I have this weird hypothesis, and I think that the chief judge and Anthony kind of touched upon it, that businesses are utilizing mediation uh, to settle disputes more during the pandemic than necessarily an adjudicative process. That's a hypothesis. Um, prove me wrong. Uh, and what are you seeing from the ICC um, as well as uh, business continuity generally? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. And I just want to echo everything that uh, my co-panel stated earlier. All excellent points I'll try to follow up on. I think, you know, when the pandemic happened, which was about a year right, in March, a year now, 12 months ago, um, many people just were not certain what to do. But a lot of business owners always are thinking ahead. One of the uh, problems was not so much transitioning from the physical space to a virtual space, but cash flow. The fact that certain um, services were not needed um, or goods were not needed and um, people who were employed where they had to be physically present um, were needed. So you had some sectors of the economy increasing and others um, decreasing a um, major, <laughs> majorly in a major way. So I know, you know, all this impacted everyone, including the law firms that provide services to businesses. So on the business side, business was scrambling to just try to make sure that the supply chain of goods <laughs> was running as smoothly as possible and as safely as possible, right? Because uh, at, at the forefront was the safety of employers um, while trying to maintain business continuity. I'm not sure if we can say, I, if I can say assertively that more businesses were using ADR. I suspect as much like you. I know that the ICC's ADR numbers increased, but um, you know, uh, having worked with the ICC now for a number of years, I remember one of the key differences is, if, for example, in the US, we have a rich ADR culture. We have a rich tradition history practice of mediation, which is not echoed or reflected elsewhere around the world necessarily. And when we do mediation, we don't necessarily use uh, the usual institutions, right? Uh, parties get together and say, and they try to negotiate settlements. Parties say, I, you, we both know so-and-so, let's have him or her um, help us mediate this dispute. Sometimes um, there'll, there'll be a lawsuit and they mediate it outside. You know, they mediate it before the lawsuit goes um, to, to, uh, um, to trial. So you, we see businesses reacting right the the advice was if everybody's having cash flow issues it may not make sense to sue or bring somebody to arbitration and get an award that you may not ultimately be able to collect on so yes it, it's a good idea to sit down and settle and you saw that happening at the level of you know housing or Business leasing, the businesses all over Manhattan, for example, in New York, everybody was trying to renegotiate contracts. Employees were trying to renegotiate contracts. So that's one of the ways they reacted. 
how the arbitral institutions reacted immediately because they had no choice. And I can see that um, Professor Daimis, Daimsis referred to the fact that, you know, courts are huge. It's not that easy for them to change the way they operate. And as many uh, arbitral cases that the institutions have, they are nowhere near what the courts have, right? So it was a massive undertaking and they needed to make sure courts did that they, whatever they were doing virtually was sanctioned. Um, and I know that the US, a part of the CARES Act was to uh, help uh, allow for video conferencing of judicial, of certain judicial acts of judicial, judicial proceedings. On the international arbitration side, the, the, all of the arbitral institutions sent out almost immediate advisories stating that since this was a health catastrophe with global implications, that they were no longer going to require physical uh, presence at hearings and that parties should take appropriate measures. So of course, some, some parties are still insisting on physical presence, but it needs, you know, one of the beautiful things about arbitration is creature of contract, especially in the process, everybody needs to agree. So the arbitrators will not show. Um, they, the parties agree, everyone agrees to postpone. So a lot of hearings are, were postponed. I have hearings that are postponed till uh, the end of next year because parties are so insistent on being there uh, physically. However, a lot of people are, were fine with going, uh, a lot of parties, I should say, or cases were fine with having their evidentiary hearings um, virtually. Now that required a lot of uh, different thinking because part of international arbitration is virtual, right? A lot of the document exchanges, uh, sometimes they have things in a secure cloud-based uh, server, but, it, it required a different thinking for arbitrators. For arbitrators, now we're required to have a very sophisticated setup, right? <laughs> My kitchen table, <laughs> if I can. Uh, two or three screens, one where you're seeing um, the documents, another where you're seeing the parties and the witnesses. And this is from talking to each other, from advice that we've shared and experiences we've shared with one another, uh, the headphones with the mics that the parties can hear you clearly, um, understanding how to use Zoom, WebEx, and uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, the arbitral institutions provided guidance for uh, instructing the parties ways to quickly continue the case efficiently without disrupting the process of the dispute resolution uh, of the, uh, I should say, of getting the award at the end. So um, they came out with guidance that not, not only gave arbitrators and the parties what should be in a procedural order, things to consider when you're going virtual, including cybersecurity, including how to store documents. Um, just there was a lot of thought given to these guidelines and guidances uh, offered by the arbitral institutions. So I, I do think you'll see when the institutions come out with their numbers, an increase in disputes, unfortunately, uh, because not all of them were able to be settled or they started the dispute in order to settle. You'll see an increase in dispute. You'll also see an in increase in mediation. But what we have now is a realization of the cost savings and benefit to the planet, planet in terms of global warming from not having everybody fly all over the world, not only to attend conferences or for the arbitration hearings. So um, everyone is anticipating a hybrid system because not everybody is, is comfortable with not having the, the interaction with a live witness. Um, so you'll still see some cases that insist on going forward with physical presence, but you will, I believe, have more of this virtual proceedings of uh, dispute resolution going on for the near future. I'll stop. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Nancy. I have a quick follow-up, a question from the audience. Um, in terms of arbitrator appointments or even recruitment, are you looking more towards MBAs, perhaps? Uh, non-lawyers, um, are they being used in these circumstances? Oh, for me, um, that, that is an interesting question. And I don't see that many non-lawyers. As a matter of fact, I have spoken to non-lawyers um, a few 
who did not believe they could qualify to serve as arbitrators and have encouraged them to serve as arbitrators um, because the business uh, ADR really was started by business people for business people. Um, the lawyers came into it, they were there at the beginning, but they came into it uh, the way we dominated. This is a fairly modern iteration of what arbitration is. Um, so people from a purely business background are always welcomed. Uh, it's just that I don't think many of them know or are comfortable um, getting the training, for example, offered by the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators to then start serving as arbitrators. But I, I would say they're all welcome. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. And it's, I just noted as well that this question was raised in the chat. And if anyone has questions to continue to submit questions there, and Ceci uh, as well responded and noted that this is not what she's seeing in Mexico and that arbitration there largely remains in the hands of the lawyers. So just uh, to, to complete that thought with uh, Ceci's remark in the chat section. So uh, to, to jump from where you left off, Nancy, I think over the last year, if anything, ADR has changed. And as Ceci said, maybe this is ADR's time. Uh, and so I, we wanted to turn to some of the other really major topics that have been talked about in this space over the last few years, especially. And one of them really is, is the question of diversity. Uh, we talked a little bit about broadening the tent, things like access to justice. So we'll, we're going to spend the next few minutes talking about that from the different perspectives that are represented on today's panel. So I'd like to begin with, with Chief Judge Brown, uh, just talking generally about how we can ensure young and diverse practitioners are aware of the importance of ADR and how do we help get them more, quote, seats at the table? Uh, I think, you know, it's important um, for those of us who are first involved in an institution to make sure we communicate the importance of the legitimacy, right, of the institution, um, how it's, it's confirmed and communicated by a fair representation of the spectrum of people you seek to serve. Um, I think it's always difficult uh, for young practitioners and it's our responsibility to reach out to them, right? Um, to make sure that they are aware. Programs like this are amazing. Um, uh, and the information it shares is such a wide range of inf information. And look at this panel and how diverse it is. And it is a representation of what this organization is. I'm so, again, just so proud to be part of it. Um, but I think it starts, it starts with organizations like this. You have access to a lot of people to make sure that um, uh, the programs that you provide are, are open equally. Um, and it's, you know, I say um, you have to be intentional, right? So you have to be looking around you, um, uh, you know, reaching out to people individually, making recommendations um, for them. Um, I certainly know that I feel an obligation uh, where it, there is a space. I don't occupy every space and it's not, I've achieved a lot in my life but even laterally, not just for people who are coming up, I'm always looking for, um, you know, uh, I'm always looking and I encourage other leaders to do that, find space beside you as well. Uh, we have to sometimes, and sometimes we have to make space um, because um, as I started this conversation, uh, the legitimacy of all of this is, uh, is confirmed when we can do that. And if you're resolving disputes, you've got to have a variety of points of view. Um, and we all have to have our own personal check. I mean, I, I live in this space a lot of the time, but I often have a, I have a list of objective checks in my mind, right? Um, to make sure if I'm putting together any panel myself or a board that, you know, I'm keeping that in mind. And as I said, we have to be intentional, you know, uh, looking out for individuals who may show some interest, show up at a panel discussion, uh, become a mentor, um, and help people who don't know the path maneuver the way. Because, you know, I mean, the only way we achieve this is if we decide we're going to do this together. And so um, I guess that's my message on that point. Um, Thank you, Judge. Brian? Yeah, um, I know we have at least three professors or former professors on our panel and one currently um, acting in that role in addition to his ADR practice. 
Uh, Professor Dames says, what does the next generation of ADR practitioners bring to the table and what do they look like? Well, increasingly uh, in my uh, experience, they're looking like uh, women. And I say this because at least the teams that I have coached in the Vismut and Jessup even, but Vismut in particular, uh, some of my top students have all have been women. They have won the top speaker prize in the world uh, more than once. In fact, I have three top speaker w women who have won the top speaker prize on the planet. So that's really great. And they have all moved on to work at firms where they are now um, involved in the arbitration practice groups. So uh, that's my contribution. No, but I think it is, you know, it, I'm seeing that more and more. I've been teaching for yes, quite a while now. And early on our mooting program uh, was it tended to attract more men than women, but the, over the past 10 years or so, it's more women than men who are the mooters. And so that is very exciting. That is one. Now, when it comes to, to diversity though, I've always, you know, I, I, we know what the difficulties are and, and it's not a nice term, but we know that one of the big downsides to arbitration, at least that's been written about, is who are the arbitrators? And there is one uh, you know, unfortunate, but probably accurate article put out about 10 years ago that said, what does an arb international arbitrator look like? And it was, uh, if you all know the punchline, uh, white, male, and stale. Right. So this is an issue, but I've always thought of arbitration and maybe it's because the way I teach arbitration, I go to its roots, its foundations, and I build up from there. And arbitration itself is a form of diversity or that's how it originated. What was where and how was it diverse? Well, it was moving away from the traditional decision makers that were perhaps appointed by states. One, two, it allowed parties to select like-minded people to sit as their decision makers. Now, of course, that has led more to a commercial like-mindedness, but the roots are there. The base is there where we can perhaps make an adjustment and realize that it's more than just commercial like-mindedness. It's more than that. There can be cultural like-mindedness. And wouldn't you want to have a decision maker on your panel who culturally understands maybe why decisions were made in the way you were transacting? And so from that perspective, I do think that perhaps we're missing an opportunity to really shift our system because that's how we get people in. And so how do you get it in? Well, you appoint them. Not because you're doing anyone a favor, but because you appreciate your case and understand that somebody who is like-minded more broadly than just commercial can actually have a very important impact in how the outcome and it takes a few more and more and that's how we build it so i, I mean I, I i do preach this that we have a system in place where diversity where we can make it happen and i suppose the challenge is that we must make it happen well, thank you. Thank you very much, for, Professor, for that. And, and, you know, obviously, the institutions play such a major role in our sort of global world, uh, global sort of picture of international and other uh, dispute resolution. Uh, so we, we have the good fortune, in addition to a number of hats that our, our, our panel members have worn over the years, of having two individuals who played and continue to play very important roles with key arbitration institutions. Uh, both globally and, re and within our region as well. So I I'd like to turn to those two, uh, and those are specifically Cecilia and Nancy, just to take a couple minutes each and tell us a little bit about, in your experience over the course of your practice, how have the institutions sort of taken a proactive role to broaden the tent to increase the number of seats at the table? Nancy or, or, or Ceci, whichever of you wants to jump in first. And Nancy, go ahead, please. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Ceci. Thank you for the question, Harut. Um, and this is it's an important question. And I agree, arbitration uh, is uh, diverse, right? And the arbitration itself is diverse. So I like to tell people that, you know, in international arbitration specifically, it is diverse if you're looking at nationality, right? Because whoever, um, you have parties from different countries who 
don't necessarily select their lawyers or law firms from that country. And then those parties together, they don't necessarily select arbitrators from those two countries, but the chair needs to be independent from a country, not of either party, for example, or, or of the arbitrators, of the co-arbitrators, so that everybody feels that it's fair. And <clears throat> to go back to uh, the judges, the chief judges, uh, words of the legitimacy of the system right now is in crisis. And, and what we do need is an intentional act, which I, I used to call purposeful, but I like intentional. So what has been happening? Because as Professor Diamond has been saying, you, we, we have been seeing a lot of, in the US, we have been seeing a lot of women in law schools. That is not the problem. The women are in law schools. What is the problem is, do they get to the law firms or do they get in practice and do they stay there and become at the highest level? I'm proud to say that in the New York and Northeast, um, we have created amongst ourselves a group of women in international arbitration. We're not just colleagues, we're friends. We try to get together and the incoming chair of um, ICC court, uh, Claudia Salmon was one of the people who work to bring us together um, to meet and, and talk to one another. And it's so enriching uh, to have that uh, network of support. Okay, now looking at, this is a problem with the legal profession in the US in general. Now let's look at arbitration. Uh, and what is happening in arbitration is that we don't have, for me, a lot of uh, people, of et ethnically diverse people part participating. We have been focusing on women. We have arbitral women and they've done a tremendously positive job of ensuring that we have more women in the practice as arbitrators, as um, practitioners. However, uh, but that work is, is ongoing. It's ongoing and it needs, and we can't sort of uh, leave our eyes away from it because I, I've seen it in my own myself the tendency is to go back to what's comfortable, which is well-known males, unless you intentionally say, this slate I'm going to select, I'm gonna make sure that it's balanced gender-wise. So at the ICC, for example, the court is perfect uh, with male and female, 50-50. <clears throat> the ICC tries that with the council and they've communicated that to all the national committees. So at the national committee level, uh, we are working very hard to make sure our regional representatives are male and female, and now we are implementing et ethnic diversity, which is, I think, harder. It's harder because just because people, for example, are from different countries does not mean they're ethnically diverse. Because what we talked about, the need for different voices in dispute resolution is a real problem and it's an advantage that we're missing out on when we don't have diverse panels. So in the US, I have been looking at trying to get more African-American in the system. And one of the reasons was the Jay-Z case, I don't know if you all remember in 2019, that was a scandal and embarrassment for all of us. And everyone was scrambling to try to make sure they had uh, representatives, African-Americans specifically, on their panels. Uh, and all of the arbitral institutions, AAA, um, AAA ICDR, CPR, JAMS, all of them have diversity initiatives. So one of the things I wanted to do for ICC um, USA was to identify African-Americans. So I worked with Catherine Simpson and to try to start bring together a list because I don't think we see them. We don't see a lot of African-Americans in this space. And now, um, unfortunately, because of COVID, one of the ways to be known because arbitration is this unique creature that one of the ways we get to know each other, or you get to know your arbitrators is through conferences and receptions and you know, personal interactions. COVID has stopped that. So we are looking at ways to bring, um, uh, to bring the groups together. And more importantly, to bring this group of African American arbitrators known to make sure that they're known and seen to the rest of us. Um, you know, Chief Justice talked about starting young and 
right now where I am, my capacity is to work with people that are already, you know, at the level to serve as arbitrators. But I know there's a lot of effort also being done at the law school level mm -hmm. uh, to bring in and make sure we have uh, that, you know, minorities, ethnic minorities, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latin Americans know about this international practice and are excited to become a part of it. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Ceci, any thoughts? Yeah, very, very briefly, I couldn't uh, agree more. And, and for ethnic um, diversity, uh, I invite everybody to uh, take a look to real organization. I'm going to post uh, that, that link for, for your benefit, but it's, it's a brand new organization and, and they're doing, uh, I mean, great. Um, I think Harut, the role of the institution is crucial given, given the scope of its services and, and the influence that such institutions have in the arbitration practice. I mean, as a community, we have a responsibility and, and, and we have to embrace it and, 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 and make it happen with, with, uh, with actions, um, specific actions. And, and of course, I can speak about ICC because I have been deeply involved in those actions from the ICC. Uh, but I think uh, that without several changes that the ICC has carried out in the last years aimed at increasing diversity, I think it would be impossible to face the changes we have been facing. Uh, for example, the, the endorsement uh, the ICC made for the pledge some years ago, the commitment uh, in terms of uh, the composition of the, of the list of candidates we provide as national committees. I, I, I had the honor to, uh, be, to belong to the, to the national committee for um, appointments or suggestions of appointments to, to, the, to the ICC for Mexico. And I remember um, it was, I mean, five years ago, even five years ago, it was pretty normal to uh, compose or, or, or to send a, a list of, 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 of colleagues, male colleagues, and, and, and that wouldn't be questioned. Now that that is questioned, I mean, you cannot send uh, only male or only female list. You have to send a diverse list when, when suggesting or when cooperating with, uh, uh, with the ICC in terms of um, proposing appointments. Um, so yes, I mean, uh, the, 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 the role of, of the of institution is, is, is crucial and, uh, and we have to take part of it. Um, I'll, I'll leave it here and I'll post uh, the link for real because I, I really invite everybody to take a look to, uh, to, the, to, to the, the activities they're carrying right. out. If I could say one more thing. Thank you, Cecilia. Sure. I meant to mention real. I'm on, uh, we're very active. It's a new and it's incredibly active and uh, many arbitral institutions from around the world participate in real. So uh, those of you who are interested in mentorship opportunities, uh, training, anything else. It's a pipeline for getting information and making contacts. So please join as, as soon as you can. Um, I'm also involved with the nominations process of arbitrators and the statistics are that about 80% of the time the parties are selecting their own arbitration, arbitrators. So a lot of work needs to be done in the community in general. 20% of the time, the institution does it, ICC does it. And when it does it, it goes to its national committee. And I'm happy to work with, we made sure the members of the nominations commission were diverse, gender and generational. And I'm probably the only ethnically diverse person that, work, that works with them. But now we're focusing on it because we want to make sure that when we have to uh, post our list, which we do now, in, in an effort of transparency that you're seeing not only male females of different ages, but also ethnically diverse arbitrators, US arbitrators. So that, that's an incredibly uh, important um, goal for us and um, welcome anyone who's interested in serving and we'll, we're working on, pe on training people to serve and on making sure people are known 
by others who are recommending arbitrators or looking for arbitrators. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Yeah, right. thank you so much, Nancy. I, I know our time is running short and what a great conversation. We haven't even made it to socioeconomic diversity or sexual orientation diversity or some of the other really important uh, progressive and protected um, classifications, I believe in Canada and the United States, and I am just not familiar with Mexico. So uh, call Cecilia for that one. Uh, moving on to our last section, interplay with the courts and who better to answer this than Chief Judge Brown. Um, ADR helps <laughs> alleviate overcrowded federal court dockets, providing greater access to justice. Can you please elaborate on the importance of ADR as it relates to the federal judiciary and what this looks like in practice? Um, I think I've, I've referred to it a little bit earlier when I talked about our internal mediation processes, but you know, now uh, more than any time I've been on the bench 10 years, um, but I imagine we saw some of that in Katrina. I have more cases stayed pending arbitration uh, than I've had in a long time. Um, and certainly we know, um, uh, you know judges, we're generalists um, and in the arbitration process, you have expertise in a way to resolve a dispute that uh, we don't have. And um, I'm fully aware that sometimes the uh, clear legal solution is not the best business solution. Um, so I'm excited always to work in partnership with uh, whatever alternative processes um, are in place um, to, um, you know, to move a, a dispute along. Um, as I said, we have um, an internal mediation process with our uh, magistrate judges. However, um, I don't know of any uh, one of my colleagues um, that would have an issue with um, a private mediator. That often that is the choice. People want to go with a private mediator. And actually, as a judge, we're often asked, would you recommend someone in particular? Um, because sometimes some of the issues will be resolved uh, that way, and then the rest of them are left to the judge. Uh, so um, I think that there is a good, um, healthy relationship there that um, it's not ex that is not exclusive. Um, that uh, um, uh, these alternative methods do assist the court in moving issues uh, more quickly through our system. Uh, but I do think it, there are, there are instances where, when we're working together, right? Uh, court can be helpful in resolving some issues that just can't be resolved and you can't get beyond that impasse because of that issue. Um, so I'm a big, um, I'm a big believer in, in, you know, all forms of resolution and, uh, and the opportunities to work together. Yeah, thank you, Judge. And, and, you know, I think part of what we're going to want to talk about just for the next few minutes as we wrap up today's program is just continue this conversation about the interplay with the courts. And so if I can continue maybe with, with Cecilia, you've mentioned a little bit some of the receptiveness of, uh, of the courts, but also the broader legal system uh, to arbitration and mediation, ADR in general. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, maybe just close up that issue on, about the receptiveness of the courts to ADR? Sure, I, I think they have been receptive. Uh, specifically if we speak about federal courts. I think there's a slight difference between uh, federal courts um, um, understanding of arbitration and mediation and uh, local courts. So as long as uh, your case end up, ends up uh, being in federal um, court, I mean, it's, it's more foreseeable or, or, or it's easier to, to, to see different types of issues you can uh, face, but I mean, it's manageable. Um, of course, as I mentioned before, uh, there has been a couple of controversial decisions uh, related to separability of the arbitration clause, uh, recognizing the judge's jurisdiction uh, to, um, uh, to, to uh, know about the, the, the validity of the clause over, over the arbitration, the arbitrator, uh, 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 jurisdiction in some cases, but generally speaking, again, the standards of the New York Convention are, are properly followed. I think the challenge remains to be time, time for enforcement. And, uh, and also there's a discussion we haven't uh, been able to overcome, uh, 
between the type of amparo that you can file against the decision on enforcement. I mean, the type of constitutional challenge you can file. Uh, is it a direct amparo or an indirect amparo? Uh, and why is relevant? Because the indirect amparo is longer. It's, it's the instantial. I mean, you have two stages. So it's relevant in terms of time for the, for the enforcement proceeding of the award. That, that remains the challenge, I think, in, in, for the judiciary. Thank you, Ceci. Brian? Uh, yes, so we move to Nancy. Um, there's been a fantastic line of Supreme Court cases in regard to class arbitration in particular, um, as well as uh, consumer employee classification. Um, the legislature has kind of pushed back with the Arbitration Fairness Act. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the prospects of that legislation and this current tension that we're experiencing between ADR being quick and cost effective, yet mass class arbitrations taking place as a result of the Supreme Court decisions? You are on mute, Nancy. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Brian, and thank you for the reminder, Harut. Um, I think I should start by saying, for example, in, in Europe, when you say ADR, it's, it's everything that is not adjudicative, right? So it doesn't include arbitration. Because I think in the US, we're very uh, amenable to ADR. P parties resolving their disputes amicably, whether by mediation, negotiation, um, neutral evaluation or dispute boards, what have you. Um, but there is pushback, of course, on domestic arbitration, especially as it applies to consumer, um, to consumers, you know, these mandatory contracts that have mandatory arbitration clause or employ or employment um, arbitrations that require um, arbitration of sexual harassment, uh, issues for uh, under work, the Wage Fairness Act, et cetera. Um, so the pushback there, the, the, the fear is that it's going to impact commercial arbitration or in, international. I, I don't think so. I really don't think so because I, I think the two animals, the, they're, they're two different animals. I think the commercial side needs to do a better job of explaining why they're different, business to business or business to state, as opposed to consumer to business or, or employee to, to business, um, employer. Um, so the last I saw on this is uh, what they are calling the Forced Arbitration and Justice Act, which was passed in the house. And if it, it proposed um, rendering invalid all disputes, um, between employ in employment and consumer co in employment forced arbitration clauses in employment and consumer contracts. So that is in the works, let's see, because the, the Senate is seen as some uh, a body that's very, uh, that's pro-business uh, for the most part and that may not uh, pass. But like it or not, these statutes are in before Congress, we have statutes that we have, you see the US as a body using ADR, for example, I was surprised to learn that there were, the Department of Justice was using it for antitrust disputes using arbitration. Um, there are a lot of um, independent dispute resolution processes and in, in several new stat, um, rules and laws passed in 2019 and 2020, but the FAIR Act is still alive. Um, and you saw with NAFTA that it took away the ISDS possibilities. And it could be that the US is becoming smarter, let's say, about ADR, arbitration and ADR, um, and not necessarily, I, we hope that the purely antagonistic view of arbitration and all sort on, to resolve all sorts of dispute is not the prevailing view, but that it's a mo much more measured and smart of you. I'll stop there. You, Nancy. And, and if we can turn just to Professor Dimes just to talk about this a little bit and see to what extent some of these issues have played out north of the border, some of these tensions. And you really began by talking about the Uber case, uh, which perhaps is a reflection of some of this. But if you can go into this a little bit more, 
as to Canada? Yes, I'd be happy to. So we, we have legislation and it's legislation that hasn't really been drafted with an eye to the other statutes. For example, we have our Consumer Protection Act. Now, what that act was a response to was a, a case from about, I think, 2002, where one of our big telecom companies inserted arbitration agreement and it was seen as an attempt to avoid the class action. Small disputes for 70 or $80 Canadian, which is about a quarter US, um, would not go to court. Hence, they inserted an arbitration clause forcing the arbitration. Well, our, our, our lawmakers responded by doing something quite interesting. It's not that they completely eliminated arbitration. What they did was to say arbitration is at the option of the consumer. So they haven't invalidated these kinds of agreements, but clauses that are looking to force parties to agree in advance do not apply. Instead, they would be converted to submission agreements provided the consumer wants that. So that's good. We also had class proceedings uh, legislation, so our class action legislation, basically. But it never turned its mind to the Consumer Protection Act. And finally, we had our just basic arbitration act, which again, wasn't looking to the other acts. And a few of our cases that have gone to the Supreme Court uh, saw our court really struggling with how these statutes interplay. So in one case, we had a very small business player who had purchased a cell phone plan and was overcharged basically charged not the way it was rounded up to the penny or to the second instead of to the minute. Well, as an individual claim, of course, the few hundred dollars that he was overcharged over six months by the time he noticed wasn't going to get him to court. So he tried to commence a class action. But our courts, again, struggling with where this person fit, said, well, you're not a consumer. So looks like we're going to have to enforce that arbitration clause. And as far as the our class proceedings legislation goes, it was drafted um, after these other statutes. So they must have known about them and they didn't have a carve out. So this individual unfortunately was stuck. He was forced to go to arbitration as are all of the small business people who were overcharged. Of course, none of those arbitrations are gonna happen. In Uber, we had the same headache, but this time we had the intersection of our Employment Standards Act. The basic case in, in Canada for Uber was Uber drivers claiming that they ought to have been employees, notwithstanding that they did sign a contract that referred to them as contractors. The case was about holiday pay, overtime pay, and benefits, which they would have been entitled to under our usual Employment Standards Act. But again, because the contract really didn't clarify if they were truly um, employees, our court struggled. But what our court has done now, and in my view, it's merely a Band-Aid solution. It's why our, our lawmakers have to get in there and figure this out. What our courts have done now, through the mechanism of unconscionability, uh, which for Canada is a big deal. I should tell you to, uh, to any US lawyers, uh, our tradition of the unconscionability doctrine has never been one that goes to particular clauses. Our courts historically approached unconscionability by saying either the contract is good or it's not. It's either unconscionable or not. They wouldn't pick apart clauses, but they have now adopted more of the US style and it is a response to seeing these kinds of arbitration clauses that don't have a legislative answer there's no statute to point to. So the court has now opened the door to using unconscionability. But as I say, it's a Band-Aid solution because unconscionability being so fact specific, companies could change the facts slightly to get the same result. The good news in Canada is this. I'm aware of one province. And if you know anything about our provincial politics, you might guess which one it is, but I, it, it, it's not a it's not public yet, but they have been working to draft a unified piece of legislation. And that unified piece would be a version that incorporates all statutes that they've been studying from different jurisdictions, from Unfair Terms Act 
to consumer legislation, to class proceedings remedy in the hope of creating one piece of legislation that will now address all the, all the cases that kind of fall through the cracks, but that are quite serious. So that's the good news. And it is an important jurisdiction, which means if they get it passed and they put it out there, other jurisdictions will probably pick up on it. So I don't know if I've uh, fully addressed all the, all the issues that have come up, but um, I am mindful of our time. Yeah, this is very helpful. Thank you, Professor. And I'll turn it back to Brian. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I realize our, our time is short, so thank you all. If um, We've been to 27 regions throughout the world through the, uh, I'm sorry, 23 webinars, 17 regions throughout the world. Closing out, I'd like to go around North America very quickly for one closing statement from each of our panelists. I wanna thank all of our attendees. I wanna thank our panelists and I wanna thank our global sponsors, the Benjamin and Cardozo School of Law and the Korean Commercial Arbitration Board as well as our Africa regional sponsor, GuyCam. So let's start with you, Nancy. I wanna thank all of you, especially the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, YM. You, Brian, and Haru, thank you so much for doing such an amazing job. Um, ADR is a force for good, especially here in North America, in the US. Thanks. Tessie, would you like to go next? Sorry, thanks. Thank you very much for the invitation. This was great, a great opportunity for me. And um, my, my, my final message will be, again, this is the time we have to embrace it and, and, and we have to prove that ADR uh, could be the solution. Thank you, Ceci. Professor Banks? Oh, okay. No. Which one? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, thanks. No. Um, again, I wanna thank you uh, for inviting me to participate. Um, I think it's a, it's a valuable dialogue to have um, and to, to allow the court to participate, I think is very meaningful. So um, again, uh, thank you so much. This is an avenue uh, and my point of view for access to just, uh, justice as well as global change. So thank you again. Thank you. So thank you. Well, I echo the sentiments and I don't think I'm deserving of one of the final words from such an esteemed uh, panel, but I'll take it. And uh, <laughs> what, what, I, what I might just say is, information dissemination is critical. People don't know unless they know. And what you've organized here today, I think is a reflection of the good. It is getting the information out there using platforms like this. And, and I don't know about you, but one of the upsides of the pandemic in particular for arbitration is we're seeing webinars that are free. In the old days, they would cost quite a bit, not to mention transport costs. So there is a bit of a, an evening with all of these free webinars. So I hope when we come out of the pandemic, this continues. Webinars out there using Zoom, available to everyone, because that is another way to get it out there. So thank you very much for inviting me. It was a, it's, it's my honor to be here today. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to me. Right, and thank you all. And I'll turn it back to Brian just to. Yeah, thank, thank you, Daru. And join us tomorrow for the grand finale, our last webinar, 23rd after 11 weeks. Thank you to the panelists again. Thank you to the attendees. It's been a fantastic world tour. And we'll see you hopefully tomorrow. Take care. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.